Where do you go when temptation comes? Recently, our six-year-old son succumbed to the temptation of chocolate. Uh, he gave me permission to tell this story. Full disclosure, I personally have an affinity for chocolate, and my son has witnessed my daily pilgrimage to the pantry. Uh, so he learned it from his father. Um, but Michelle and I, we had stepped outside to soak up some California vitamin D, um, and we had left Jed at the dining room table to continue with a craft that he had been doing. We were outside for about 20 minutes. Um, I had a timer on. And so when we came in, we were expecting him to still be at the table doing his craft. But to our surprise, no Jed was at the table. And so as we were wondering where he was, uh, the thing that gave him away was the sound of a wrapper underneath the dining room table. There he was, crouched on the floor, under the table that we had left him at, with a wrapper in his hand and a face full of chocolate. Temptation has a strong pull, doesn't it? Even when we know it's wrong, even when we know that there will be consequences, we often choose to succumb to it anyway, and we crawl under the table hoping that no one will find us in our sin. Well, this morning, uh, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 12 through 13, where Paul gives us three truths about temptation that will help us to endure it, rather than hide under the table when we stumble into it. Here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. In this passage, I want us to see how Paul equips us with three truths about temptation so that we would not surrender to it, but dependently endure through it. As we look at these three truths about temptation, my prayer is that we would be equipped to dependently endure through whatever the Lord allows in our lives. Now, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And this is a church that's in the middle of a culture where immorality was encouraged, idolatry was exalted, and integrity was nowhere to be found. And Paul had planted this church on his second missionary journey around AD 50. And we read in Acts 18.11 that Paul settled in Corinth for a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. This church had the privilege of being taught by the Apostle Paul for a year and a half. Imagine that. Over 500 days, they were taught by a man who wrote just over half of the New Testament books that we hold today. And that is a pretty solid introduction to the Christian faith, isn't it? This was a well-taught church, and yet they still had a ton of issues. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 10, we learn that uh, 1 Corinthians wasn't actually the first letter that Paul had penned to this church. This is what we read. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, for then you would have to go out of the world. In God's providence, Paul's first letter is not scripture, but his mention of it shows us that he had previously written to lay out ethical guidelines which were then misunderstood by the church, which prompted him writing this letter we know as 1 Corinthians. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, 17, Paul mentions three men who came to tell him about these misunderstandings and ask some questions on behalf of the church. In chapter 1, Paul also mentions reports of division that he had received from Chloe's people in verse 11 of chapter 1. So in response to these two reports, Paul picks up his pen and parchment and he's set to writing what we now know as 1 Corinthians to address these concerns and questions which had been brought to him uh, by the church. So 1 Corinthians then is a letter of correction. Correction of beliefs that were causing wrongful division and behaviors which were tarnishing their reputation. This church was beginning to look more like the world that they lived in rather than the Christ who lived in them. And so Paul spends the first half of the letter addressing these concerns that were brought to him. Uh, their pride, their fleshly living, self-deception, uh, 
immorality among them and lawsuits between believers. And then in chapter 7, Paul transitions to answering their questions with this phrase, now concerning, or some translations, now about, or now regarding. And this is important because it helps us to frame what Paul is writing about. Listen to the beginning of these sections. This is from the NASB translation. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote. Chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Chapter 11, verse 2, now I praise you, but I want you to understand. Chapter 12, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, verse 1, now I make known to you. And chapter 16, verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. You see, our passage this morning is in this section from chapter 8, verse 1 through 11, verse 1, where Paul is answering a, a plethora of questions that have been brought to him um, by the Corinthians. And this particular question in our section today is about Christian liberty, the freedoms that we have in Christ. And it's a question that seeks to understand how our Christian freedoms interrelate, because the church as we know it is made up of saved sinners at varying levels of sanctification or maturity. And you might be thinking, so how does temptation fit in this context? Well, in chapter 8, Paul answers a question about meat offered to idols. That's kind of the basis of his uh, question answering in this section. And so he explains that the freedoms that we have in Christ take a back seat to the people for whom Christ died. In 8 verse 13, Paul says that he would be willing to give up his freedom if it might cause his brother to fall. And then he continues in chapter 9 by outlining his own rights as an apostle. Now, we live in a culture that knows all about rights, don't we? I mean, we have new rights being thought up all the time. Rights defended in court, rights written into law. We might be willing to die for some of those rights if we really believe in them. But Paul sees his personal rights as disposable. They don't belong to him. They're not for his glory, for his gain, but they serve a higher purpose. He would gladly give them up if it enables him to become all things to all men so that he may by all means save some. That's what he says in chapter 9, verse 22. So Paul doesn't live to defend his own rights, but to see others declared righteous through Christ. That is his goal. And Paul is committed to running that race well. He's running to win. He wants to be disciplined and vigilant in his gospel focus. And like a runner training day and night, his goal is to win the race. He understands that he is not above being disqualified, even as an apostle. That if he loses focus and gets off track, then that is a recipe for disaster. And we all face the temptation to relax our spiritual focus, don't we? It can be tempting to think that our Christian freedoms are for us. Forgetting that we, did, we didn't earn them, but we've freely received them from Christ. But Paul equips us in this section with three truths about temptation, so that we would not surrender to it, but dependently endure through it for our growth and for God's glory. So let's read our passage again. It says this, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Here's our first truth. Look out for pride, because it will make you fall. We find this in verse 12. Look out for pride, because it will make you fall. The church in Corinth had a reputation for pride, a reputation that Paul addressed in chapter 1 by reminding them to boast in the Lord. But Paul wants to protect them from that fall. He takes no delight in the failure of a brother or a sister. He loves them, and so this strong warning is necessary. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Therefore, clues us in that the prior context is critical to understanding this warning. Paul wants us to see something. He wants us to see the Old Testament examples of pride. 
And Paul could have used a lot of passages here and stories from the Old Testament to illustrate the pitfalls of pride. He could have talked about Haman, the second most powerful man in Persia during Esther's time. Uh, this man was hung on a gallows that he had built for Mordecai, Esther's uncle, all because Haman's pride had blinded him. Or Sennacherib in Isaiah 37, the king of Assyria, who pridefully taunted Israel that their God could not save them. And soon after, the angel of the Lord entered the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000. Sennacherib returned home defeated, only to be assassinated by two of his sons. Paul could have unpacked Proverbs 16 verse 18 to simply explain that pride goes before destruction. And yet, Paul chooses to take these Gentile believers back to the early days of Israel, before she even had her own land. This was a time when God was manifest among them. This was an incredible season of God miraculously manifesting His awesome power and abundant provision. God Himself had just ransomed them from slavery in Egypt and was now leading them to the promised land. This was a shared experience for all of Israel at the time. One might assume kind of a high point in their history as a nation. Chapter 10 verse 5 of 1 Corinthians brings a sobering reminder of pride's consequences. This is what Paul writes, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Most of them here is kind of the understatement of this age. You know, two million people left slavery in Egypt, and yet only two from that generation would enter the promised land. Over a period of 40 years, the pride of man turned a barren desert into a bleak graveyard for an entire generation. An entire generation that had become overconfident in their standing and their usefulness to God. And so in chapter 4, Paul had sarcastically blasted the Corinthians for a similar attitude of arrogance. 4 verse 8, he said this, You're already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. The Corinthians were confident in their standing before God. Overconfident. They had made it, spiritually speaking, according to their own assessment. But by God's standard, they were closer to becoming fools. Back to chapter 10, verse 6. Israel had surrendered uh, to a culture of idolatry. The Corinthian church, likewise, was surrounded by idolatry. Israel had pursued immorality, and Corinth was the world's foremost provider of fornication and perversion. Israel had put the Lord to the test. Christians in Corinth had ample opportunity to put their freedoms to the test. Israel grumbled and was, was discontent with what the Lord had given them. The believers in Corinth had their contentment tested daily by a culture filled with distraction and depravity. Now, Paul reminds us, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's the Old Testament examples, which now brings us to the exhortation against pride. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. See, in light of all that had happened to Israel, this warning is far more serious. You've heard it said that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, picture a desert with two million bodies scattered across it, Paul says to Corinth. Let that sober you in your self-assessment. We ought to pause and we ought to ask ourselves some questions. Am I living a disobedient or undisciplined life while believing that God is okay with it? Is Christ the priority of my life as evidenced by a habit of humbly submitting to His Word? Is there sin in my life which I know that God is not pleased with? Why am I unwilling to give it up? This is a sobering heart check, one that we must take seriously. And when we seriously consider this warning, we learn that we cannot stand in our own strength. And so we must look out for pride because it will make us fall. I mean, it's a sobering warning, isn't it? But there is hope for us because what we face when temptation comes is not unique 
to you and I as individuals. And this brings us to Paul's second truth about temptation, which tells us to look at humanity because temptation is normal. We, we look at humanity because temptation is normal. This is verse 13. And maybe that doesn't sound helpful to you, but think about it with me. See, temptation, I think, is often a dirty word in Christianity. Let me show you what I mean. A young mom shares that she struggles with the temptation to angrily scream at her children when they misbehave. A middle-aged man shares that he is often tempted when young girls walk past his office after school. And a high school friend who you thought loved Christ shares that they were recently tempted to get drunk and sleep with their girlfriend. How do those situations make you feel? I mean, do you feel kind of concerned, maybe, or appalled even, or perplexed? Yeah. We can kind of hesitate in our heart when we hear someone express how they were tempted. Or often, in our own heart, we feel ashamed when we are tempted by something. But this gives us hope that victory is possible. See, because tempt temptation is not synonymous for failure. It's not a different way to spell defeat. The Greek for temptation doesn't translate to S-I-N, sin. Temptation, as Paul uses it here, is it simply means to test or to prove. And James tells us a similar thing, that, that sin results when we are carried away and enticed by our own lust. See, our fleshly lusts like what they see in the temptation, and so we pursue it. And it proves that we lust after it, that we desire it, that we want it. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin is the problem. So temptation will either negatively entice our evil desires and result in sin, as it did with Judas, who betrayed the Lord for just a bag of silver and greed. Or it will positively reveal our righteous character resulting in godliness. Right? Think of Joseph when he, he ran from the advances of Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39. That was a righteous response to temptation. For the Corinthian believers, this is a message of hope. These Corinthians, according, according to Paul, even with all their issues, are people who, verse, chapter 1 verse 2, are people who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, who all with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These were believers. So the temptations faced by these believers in Corinth, a morally bankrupt culture, they're not new to them. They've been experienced before by past generations. They'll be experienced by future generations. And it's the same is true for you and I. Temptation is normal for humanity. And so the temptation faced by the young mom, the middle-aged man, and the high school student are not new or unique. They're human. And yet, their humanness, it's not an excuse to give in to the temptation. Rather, the humanness of temptation forces us to look outside of ourselves as we face it and as we seek to overcome it. Because we recognize that humanity as a whole has not been able to overcome this problem of temptation. So we need to find someone who can sympathize with us, yet who will not be carried away by their desires when temptation comes. In Hebrews 2, we find this one. His name is Jesus. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that is, human in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, to suffer the wrath of God for the sins of the people. For, and don't miss this, since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. That's us. Jesus was tempted, but he didn't fail in that temptation. And so he is able to come to our aid when we are tempted. Hebrews 4.15 goes even further, and it, it outlines how the Lord Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, yet he did not sin. See, temptation will come upon us because it's normal. It's a normal human experience. But when it comes, we must know where to turn for help in the battle. 
which brings us to Paul's third and final truth about temptation, and one that ought to make our hearts rejoice. Look to God because He is faithful. Look to God because He is faithful. This is the second half of verse 13. But remember verse 12, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The Corinthians were overconfident in their own ability and effort to stand firm against temptation. They had an I've got this attitude. They were willing to flirt with the world, thinking they were immune and falling to its te- from falling to its temptations. They were using their Christian freedoms to gratify themselves rather than glorify God. But there is hope for them, says Paul. Look back at verse 13. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. God is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is dependable. He is worthy of our full confidence. Is the God of Scripture the first one we look to in the face of temptation? Do we have the sword of the Spirit in the sheath of our mind, ready to be drawn out when temptation comes to fight that battle? And do our knees bear the scars of the battle that we have faced as we cry out to God for the strength to endure? We have a faithful God. We can depend on Him to help us in times of temptation. But how exactly does He help us? You know, Paul doesn't leave us to guess here, but he gives us two ways in which God's faithfulness helps us in temptation. And the first one is this. God is faithful to limit our temptation so that we can handle it. God is faithful to limit our temptation so we can handle it. Verse 13 again. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. See, there is a limit to the temptation which God will allow. Not sometimes, but every time. The Corinthians lived in a culture which had no moral boundaries. Everything was acceptable. Everything was offered for the taking. From earlier in this letter, it appears that many were enticed by what was offered by the culture. And Paul reminds them that there is hope of change and growth because the God who set the boundaries for the ocean is the same God who sets the limits for the temptations that they would face. As a parent of young kids, you know there are certain things that I won't allow my kids to experience yet. We understand that a child's growth will be harmed without boundaries. And God is the same with his children. He understands that we are limited in our ability to resist temptation. It has been said by some that God loves us just as we are. And yet he loves us too much to leave us that way. He's like the the master sculptor who slowly chips away the small pieces of of a big stone in order to reveal a masterpiece. And so God takes, uh, he he uses the, the hammer and chisel of trials and temptation to chip away the flesh so that ultimately Christ is displayed through us. He cares for us deeply and he will not allow us to be tempted or tested beyond our ability. We see this clearly in the life of Job. Right? He lost everything because God allowed Satan to take it from him. And yet God set a limit. In chapter 2, verse 7, The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Job lost everything. His wealth, his livelihood, his children, his health. The temptation before Job that was so clearly articulated by his wife was to give up his integrity, to curse God. And die. Be done with God, she said. He's not with you. He's against you. But Job's response, listen to it. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? The Corinthians could find hope in the knowledge that what they faced would not overpower them so long as they were depending on God. He is the faithful one who would limit their temptation. But not only does God limit our temptation, But he's also faithful to light our path so that we can endure it. He faithfully lights our path so that we can endure it. But with the temptation, verse 13, he will provide the way of escape also so that we will be able to endure it. Now, we must 
caution our hearts here, lest we think that God is the author of temptation. James 1.13 declares that God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God allows temptation up to a certain limit, but he does not directly author it. So where does it come from? Well, James continues, Each one, that's us, is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. See, temptation comes about when our flesh meets an opportunity. And for the Corinthians, there were many of these opportunities that their flesh was attracted to. There was adultery, fornication, idolatry, greed, gluttony, and every other sin and vice that you can think of. And we need help when our flesh is presented with an opportunity to sin. And God is faithful to provide a way of escape when those opportunities come. He's given us the scriptures which articulate some simple truths which help us to fight against this temptation. Think of the businessman, maybe tempted by greed. Well, he must confront his heart with the truth that he cannot serve God and money. He can only serve one master, according to Matthew 6. Which one will he serve? The teenager, tempted by lust, must confront his heart with the truth that the feet of an immoral woman go down to death. And following her will only bring him pain and destruction. Proverbs 6 teaches him that. The young woman, tempted to be critical, must confront her heart with the truth that it was God's kindness that led her to repentance. And so kindness ought to be her way of life also as she responds to others. Romans chapter 2 and Ephesians 4 teach her that. The psalmist also reminds us that we must treasure God's word in our heart so that we will not sin against him. Psalm 119 verse 11. The psalms are filled with prayers of petition, asking for help, and then praising God because he faithfully delivers them. He will provide the way of escape. But notice the next phrase, so that you will be able to endure it. God faithfully lights our way by his word, but he hasn't promised to remove temptation from us. Paul prayed three times to have a thorn in his flesh removed, and yet the Lord's response was, My grace is sufficient for you, 2 Corinthians 12. Paul learned that this thorn was given to him to keep him humble, to keep him from exalting himself. See, God enables us to endure as we depend on him so that ultimately he gets the glory. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them? They perfectly illustrate this. In Daniel 3, King Nebuchadnezzar had set up a golden statue of himself and and commanded the people to worship it. But these three God-fearing friends of Daniel refused to bow down. Nebuchadnezzar threw a fit. Listen to what he said. If you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? What arrogance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king with this. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, in the face of temptation to worship a false god for fear of losing their lives, these men stood firm entrusting themselves to God, who they knew to be faithful, that he would deliver them from the king and from this fiery furnace. They didn't know how God would deliver them from the king. Their deliverance could have been through death. They were ready for that. They didn't know that the Lord would deliver them through the fire. They endured the flames by God's strength alone, and they came out unscathed. Not even the hint of, not even the smell of the fire was upon them. These men endured the temptation to give in to the culture that was around them, not based on anything within them, but because they looked to God and they understood that He is faithful. They fully entrusted themselves to Him so that, he, so that they could stand firm on the hope of His promises, even when it meant, even if it meant, their certain death. And where do you go when temptation comes? Do you go to the mirror in search of an answer from within yourself? Do you turn to the world for its therapies and and prescriptions? 
Or maybe even you turn to the church, thinking that religion and virtue will help you. Or maybe you're like our son who, who tries to hide under the table and acts like maybe, maybe it won't be seen. But friend, there is only one place that we must go in order to endure temptation. Our pride will make us fall. And the rest of humanity is, is struggling with the same thing as us. But God is faithful. He's so faithful that He sent His Son to endure temptation beyond what any of us will ever face. And Jesus endured it willingly and without sin. Temptation must not cause us to hide from God, but instead to run to Him in dependence on His promised provision for what we need to endure it. He has given us the way of escape now by enduring through the temptations we face as He makes us more like Christ. And in the future, we have this hope of deliverance from temptation in its fullness, where we will be in His presence because of the spilled blood of Christ on our behalf. And so next time you stare temptation in the face, don't rely on your own efforts, but look to our faithful God. If you don't know him yet, I beg you to cry out to him. Ask his forgiveness. Ask for his deliverance from becoming wrath and from help in overcoming your sin. And if you are his child, thank him that he is faithful and commit to depending on him as you endure temptation, knowing that he is faithful and he will give you the strength to endure it so that he gets the glory.